right, I guess we're ready to go. Um, once again, thank you all very much for being here. Uh, my name is Greg Robinson. I'm a professor in natural sciences here uh, at Gulf Coast State College. Um, I am currently filling in for Professor Carrie Fioramonti, uh, who usually hosts these, but today is her birthday, so she gets to go home and have a nice dinner. Um, and I get to hear about box turtles, which is very exciting. Uh, so here in a minute, I'm going to uh, introduce our speaker, Mr. Adam uh, Kayser. Uh, but first, I want to let our um, like official sponsors, which is St. Andrews Bay Resource Management Association, I'm going to let them say a couple of words just real quick. Hey, good evening, everybody. My name is Michelle Council. I'm a member of St. Andrews Bay Watch, or RMA. And a great question on, on next event. If you're, in a best case, if you're a member of St. Andrews Bay Watch uh, on our mailing list, you'll get notified for all the citizen science, or you can also join our Facebook page. And we also publicize all of our events on uh, the Facebook page. And I would be remiss without mentioning that this Saturday is the International Coastal Cleanup Day. And we are working with the FSU Estuary Program to sponsor that, in addition to the city of, of Panama City. And so that's gonna happen this Saturday from eight to one. At, uh, at St. Andrews, so everything's gonna be provided if you wanna come out, at the grabbers, the bags, everything. So you just go where you wanna go to pick up trash, bring it back. Um, you can participate for an hour, four hours, whatever, you know, whatever you like. So I would encourage you to, uh, uh, we're gonna have some raffle prizes there, uh, Baywatch will, so I encourage you to participate in that as well. So if you don't know about Baywatch or the Resource Management Association, we've been around since the 80s doing conservation and advocacy work for, for the estuary. And um, you can check us out on standrewbaywatch.org to learn more about our programs, and, and we'd love to have you uh, to be a member. And we co-sponsor this with, with Gulf Coast, and uh, are really happy, this is actually our kickoff uh, session. And um, you know, wanna recognize Brittany back there who is, is helping for, uh, from the FSU Estuary Program. They are also uh, helping us to co-sponsor this as well. So um, enough of me, let's get to the box turtles. Thanks. All right, thank you. All right, so um, now it is my pleasure to introduce uh, Mr. Adam Kayser, who will be talking to us about the uh, Bay County Box Turtle Project. Uh, a little bit of background for Mr. Kayser, he works for U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Uh, he's been in the area since 2011, is it? Been in the area since 2011 doing research with like mussels and things like that and uh, I'm sure he will tell us how he came to be a uh, leader in the box turtle conservation movement here so thank you very much. Oh, I will mention one more thing if you would please hold your questions to the end. Uh, we're gonna have a Q&A session and uh, if you have a question at the end I will bring the mic to you uh, so that we can get the questions and answers recorded. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. I, I learned that uh, Greg's actually a trained herpetologist, so any difficult questions, I'm gonna, I'm gonna send them his way. Um, great to see all of you. Thank you so much for the invitation to be here. I feel like I'm getting a very special welcome with all of this production crew here. Um, second time only that I've given a talk in public about this project, but we started in 2019, so we're into our, our four, fourth year of monitoring Bay County's box turtles. And I'm not just talking about any old box turtle. Here in this area we have the Gulf Coast box turtle and um, believe it or not there are four subspecies of box turtles, eastern box turtles, and the range map is shown, shown here in the middle. The Gulf Coast box turtle is found across the Florida Panhandle all the way to Louisiana shaded in the purple area there and um, Florida has um, all four types of box turtle present within its geographic boundaries, and they can interbreed with one another. So there's, there can be quite a bit of variation uh, observed in the Gulf Coast box turtle. The name major suggests that this is a large box turtle, and it is in fact the largest of the four subspecies. It's also been described as the most aquatic, or being found around marshy, wet areas. And here in Bay County, we've got a lot of uh, moist areas, especially when we get the, the rain that we've been getting the last few years. So, uh, seems that we have some pretty good habitat potentially for the Gulf Coast box turtle. Let me talk a little bit about the life history of this species. Starts out as an egg in the ground, just like sea turtles. They dig a shallow nest, they cover the eggs up, 
and then conceal the nest. So it's, it's uncommon that you'd ever actually find box turtle eggs unless you were digging around in the garden or something like that. It takes two months for the eggs to incubate and then hatch out, and then it takes several days for the hatchlings to dig their way out of the nest and emerge. And when they do, they're about the size that you see here. Um, fairly nondescript, little yellow stripe down the back of the turtle, um, super cute, very easy to handle, and so on. Uh, within the first couple of years, they turn into juvenile turtles, and at this point, they can fully enclose themselves in their shell, uh, which is something only the box turtle can do. That's how it gets its name, box turtle. Um, and they started to develop that patterning that you see on the shell, but that's not fully developed until adulthood. Um, so the patterns that you see here on juvenile turtles will change over time. By age five or six, male turtles have reached sexual maturity, and you can start to identify some characteristics to distinguish males versus females. So the males are larger. Uh, the carapace, which is the top shell, is um, typically wider and more flattened. And then in the Gulf Coast box turtle, they, have, they often have flare along the rear marginal scutes. That's, that's this area here, the, sh the shell. You see this one here has got a lot of flare. Uh, if you were to turn one over, an adult box turtle, a uh, male box turtle, will have a concave area in the center of the, um, center of the shell here. And uh, that's to help with mating. Uh, now, the, another unique thing about Gulf Coast box turtles is some males have white markings on their head. And so the one I've shown showing you here, his head is almost completely white, except for this black eye patch. If you see this, uh, if you see a white-headed box turtle, you know for sure it's a male. Okay, let's talk a little bit about females. It takes them a little bit longer to reach adulthood, but uh, they're generally smaller than males. The shell is more rounded and um, also more domed to accommodate the eggs that um, they're producing. And if you were to turn one over, um, the, the plastron, which is the bottom part of the shell, is completely flat. Um, they also have a lot less flare along the rear marginal scutes. So box turtles are considered ecological generalists. They can occupy a wide range of habitats and eat a variety of food. They're omnivorous. They eat both plant and animal um, food items. Um, but despite being generalists, they have some specific needs uh, in our area, and that's one of the things they're working to try to determine. So here in Florida, with the heat, in the heat of the summer, box turtles need places to shelter to get out of the heat. Um, it's rare to find a box turtle out in the open basking in the sun in the middle of the day of Florida. That's just not something you're going to find them doing. Um, and so suitable habitat for box turtles offers um, this shelter to provide humidity, damp conditions, and um, a little bit cooler temperatures. And so again, also canopied habitat is important. So the tree canopy um, that, that uh, is over our residential areas is important to maintaining ground level moisture. And then the low-lying um, uh, vegetation is important for them to uh, hide in during the day. A few life history characteristics of the Gulf Coast box turtle. They produce um, just a few number of eggs each year, so they have low reproductive output, and there's a high egg and hatchling mortality uh, rate, you know, so the young ones don't make it to adulthood very often. So as a result, um, there's a low rate of recruitment or addition of new box turtles into a population. It takes them longer to reach maturity, we talked about that, um, but once they do, there's high survivorship. So turtles can, once they're mature, they can live for decades even, and, and the oldest box turtle in North America was um, determined to be over 100 years old. I don't think they live that long here, but because um, generally as you move south on um, the range of species, the animals um, grow faster but live shorter lives, and up north they live longer. That 100-year-old turtle was up in the northeast that I was talking about. So these characteristics um, comprise what ecologists call the equilibrium life history strategy. So animals that exhibit this strategy are um, favored by stable environmental conditions, but they're sensitive to environmental disturbance and slow to recover from disturbance. So when I say disturbance, what kind of things am I talking about? What kind of impacts to the environment might we be talking about? Well, most of you, or perhaps all of you, have lived through one of these disturbances recently in the form of Category 5 Hurricane Michael back in the fall of 2018. And um, here's a look at one of the neighborhoods where we're monitoring box turtles. On the left is the northern end of College Point up in Lynnhaven, before the storm and then after the storm. 
And um, you know, if you haven't taken time to look at some of these images, it's really striking. You can't exaggerate just how much change has occurred on the landscape. So just catastrophic loss of tree canopy. Um, so that was the first major disturbance. And the second was that um, occurred during all of the cleanup efforts after the storm. So all of that debris was piled up on the, uh, the street in the corners and stuff, and it sat there for a while. And then heavy machinery came through and lifted up, you know, carried it away. Well, that all occurred at the time that box turtles would be sheltering during the winter. So there, there's a period of dormancy a few months uh, during the winter, and they'll find brush piles and stuff to hide in. So there's really no telling how many box turtles we might have lost uh, as a result because our monitoring didn't start till after the hurricane, really, officially. Um, but it stands to reason that you know, there are fewer now than there were b before, and those that survived the hurricane are now faced with uh, a, a very drastically altered landscape in terms of the type of conditions that um, are suitable for them. So why study box turtles? Well, there's little, really little known about the Gulf Coast subspecies, and it's thought to be in decline in, in many places. Um, and there's really no studies at all of the Gulf Coast subspecies in residential areas. But um, I've come to find that most people really adore box turtles, so, and they want to keep them around. You know, it's really hard to be mad or upset at a box turtle. So I think that it's really easy to find people that are willing to support uh, the project and get behind the idea that we want to keep box turtles around. So the first goal of the project is to improve our scientific understanding of this subspecies and better manage for their survival in our community. And the second is to monitor the recovery of the natural elements of our neighborhoods following Hurricane Michael using box turtles as an indicator. Um, I think we'll find over time whether that um, proves to be a, a good way to, to monitor the recovery of the tree canopy and, and so on. So how are we going about doing this? Right now we have three tagging teams located in neighborhoods of Bay County. We have one in Lower Grand Lagoon, another in the Cove, and another up in College Point. And um, most of the team members listed here are professional biologists with U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service or the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission. Uh, these are the folks that are on our permit and are allowed to actually stick tags on turtles. Um, but this isn't enough people to do the type of monitoring and data collection that we're interested in. So this is really uh, fundamentally a citizen science project. Um, in order to be successful, we need um, the assistance of, of anyone out in, in the public that comes across turtles to report them to us and generate the observational data that we need to um, estimate some of, the, some of the population parameters that I'll talk about a little bit later. But throughout the course of the talk, you're going to learn um, how to become a participant, how to become a citizen scientist in this project. All right, first let me talk a little bit about how we're marking the box turtles. Um, traditionally, box turtles are marked with a triangular file to make notches in the scoots, which are those uh, marginal um, bony plates along the outer perimeter of the carapace. But, um, not only is this difficult to sort of maintain uh, across a larger group, but the general public would not be able to readily recognize these notches and interpret them and report the individuals. So instead, what we're doing is we are um, using super glue gel to affix a very small vinyl tag to the fourth right scoot of the turtle. And um, these are tags that are, are used for various other purposes. Uh, in biology, but uh, it turns out they work really well for box turtles. So if you find a come across a box turtle in one of these neighborhoods, or anywhere really, you're looking in the back rear part of the shell for a small a yellow tag, and the tag will have a letter and three numbers, and that's a unique identifier for that, um, that individual. So how does Bay County Box Turtle Project work? It starts when a team member uh, encounters a box turtle out in the neighborhood, and um, this turtle is then measured and a variety of other sort of data are collected on a field data sheet that we, that we have, um, and the turtle is then tagged at that time. When the turtle is tagged, it gets a name, okay? The turtle is then released at the exact location it was found, and that's super important because box turtles, other turtles have a very strong homing mechanism and if you move them away from their home range, they're going to try to go back to it. So you always want to release a turtle or leave it where you found it, basically. 
And then the data are entered into a database by one of our team members. All right, a little bit more about the names. This is just for fun, really. Um, this, I'm just showing you a list of the B names that have been assigned to turtles. And um, I'll show you how you can, uh, <laughs> how you can look, look up the names that have been assigned. There's, there's over 400 or 500 names that have been. And so it, it gets kind of, you know, it gets fun to check out some of them. Um, one of my favorites is, uh, if there are any Jimi Hendrix fans out there, Boxy Baby, that's, that's one of my favorites. <laughs> okay, how does Bay County Box Turtle work for you, the citizen scientist? So you're out and about walking the dog, taking an early morning walk, you encounter a, a box turtle. Please just resist the urge to put the turtle under your shoulder and carry it home and try to contact us to arrange for tagging because we really don't, this is all a side project, this is an official business of these agencies, so we don't really have the, the ability to respond um, in that way. Um, but what you can do is um, pull out your trusty cell phone, open up the camera and get right over the turtle, um, directly over the top of the shell, center it in the viewfinder, um, make sure it's focused, and take a picture of the turtle. And if it has a tag, take a second picture of the tag close up, make sure it's focused. Um, you wanna note just a few things, the date, <clears throat> the time, the nearest address to where the turtle is located, and then that tag ID number. Okay. Then you send your data to Bay County Box Turtle Project, and there's two ways to do this. The first is to text the information to one of the turtle lines, and you can also attach your photos um, when you're doing this. And the second is to enter the data into a Google sighting form. Um, that works if you have a Google account. Most people do, but if you don't, that will not work for you. You'll have to use the turtle line. And then when the, those data come in via those two methods, then a team member will enter the data into the database. Okay. Let me explain how to find out where these turtle line numbers are located and or the link to the Google sighting form. All right, what you wanna do um, at home or on your cell phone is call up Google and type in Bay County Box Turtle Project. You could do it right now if you wanted to, but that's not necessary. Um, what will come up is our Facebook page. I'll tell you right now, I don't do Facebook very much. I wish I posted more often, I don't. But um, we do have a page, and this is what it looks like, okay? Um, now, at the, if you click on posts, there's a pin post, which the pin post is always at the top of the list of posts. Or you can click on the About tab and scroll down and expand that. Uh, and if you do, this is what you're going to find. Okay, this is the, web, the Facebook page. I expanded the About tab, and then you scroll down. Okay, and here, here you have how to report a turtle sighting. All right, this first link here is the link to the Google sighting form. If you click on this and you have a Google account and you're signed in, this, will, this pops up. This is the box turtle sighting form. You just simply put in um, your information here. You click next and go through a couple pages and it'll give you the option to upload photos. You do that, you hit send, and it goes straight to um, our database. Um, back to this. If you don't want to take, do that option, you simply want to text the information in, you would be looking here. Um, okay, and here's the numbers for those, well, two neighborhoods, but now we have three, um, that you would go ahead and text the information to and upload your attach your photos and send them as well. If you continue scrolling down, you'll find a couple other useful links. Here's how to view turtle data in the turtle mapper. I'll explain that in a minute. Here's instructions for using the turtle mapper. Um, and here is a list of the turtle, turtle IDs and their names in case you wanted to just flip through the, all the names and see what else, what other names are out there. Okay, back to Back to this, okay, I just explained all of that for you really quickly, so let me go to this next slide here. Oh, turtle mapper. I should have just stayed on the turtle mapper. Okay, once the data is entered into our database, it will appear on the turtle mapper. So if you want to determine whether we've gotten to your record and entered it into the database, you can look it up on the turtle mapper. And um, I'll just spend a, a minute or two explaining how, how to use some of the functions here. On the left, there's a tool here that says filter records. Oh, by the way, every one of these little green turtles is a turtle sighting location, of course. Um, the filter tool. So you click on that, and you can filter by a variety of, of fields here. 
Um, but let's say you were out, um, out and about and you, you stumbled upon turtle um, ID M244. You can type that in. It comes up. Okay, and the turtle mapper then zooms to the extent to which all of our observations have been collected for that individual. So here we have maybe nine or so observations of this M244. Um, this turtle's name is Misty. It was first tagged on August of 2019. Um, it then started uh, maybe making its way this way where it was spotted a few times. Then it was spotted here on um, March 9th of 2020. But then a year later, just about a year later in 20, uh, March of April of 2020, it appeared on the other side of the bayou. Um, that's a little curious because that's a, that trek right there is almost a mile. And I mean, turtles can walk a pretty good distance, but you know, they usually have a home range. And anyway, I, I was a little curious about that until one of our neighbors here reported that same turtle swimming in the bayou 100 yards from shore. And then he, he sat there and waited till it swam back ashore. And then he confirmed that it was 244. So um, this isn't the only time this has happened, by the way. But I never thought box turtles would swim across bayous. Uh, I now think we have some pretty good circumstantial evidence that they do that. Um, let me give, do another little um, thing here. Let me search for M452 and see what we get. Okay. All right, this is another curious story, and I could go on and on about this stuff. But here we have this turtle here named Ichabod that was tagged up in Isaacburg Park on October of 2020. And then we have this location way over here, and immediately you'd think, all right, this, this can't be right. The turtle did not walk all the way over there. And you're right, it did not. It did not walk over there. One day we got a phone call. Some a fellow who was a contractor that works out in condominiums out there said, I was cleaning out this apartment, and I found a box turtle in an aquarium that had been abandoned, and it had the tag on it. And he did some searching on the internet, found Bay County Box Turtle Project. Next thing you know, he's calling us saying, hey, do you want this turtle back? So we did drive out there. We got the turtle from him, and we returned it to Isaacburg Park. So that kind of stuff happens. Um, really short, we had a turtle that was tagged in Gulf County that appeared in Miami-Dade County. So once you start putting tags on animals, you've, you realize that, you know, in the, particularly in the case of box turtles, they're being moved around a lot more than we think or thought they, they were. And that's not necessarily what we're looking to do here. OK, back to the talk. Um, let's see. All right, just a little bit about the science that we hope to do in the future. I don't, we're not really gonna get into results so much tonight because we're, we're still early, early stage here. But some of the things that, um, that biologists typically do when they're studying populations is try to determine how many animals are out there, what, their, what is their density, what are their survival rates, and what are the trends over time. So these are the things we're interested to do with the data we're collecting. And one way to do this is to organize all of the observational data that are coming in from our team members and from the public into something called a capture recapture matrix. So in this matrix on the left hand side, you would have each uh, individual turtle. And then across the, uh, the columns of the matrix, you have time periods. In this case, we just say years, 2019, 2021. So in this first row here, we have turtle B525. If there's a one in the cell, it indicates it's been observed that, that in that year. A zero is it was not observed. So here's, in this fictitious example, this turtle was seen each of the years that we've been observing. But then these next three were, were, were seen and tagged in 2019, but they weren't observed in 2020 or 2021. And there's various things that could have happened here. Either the turtle could have deceased and it's no longer out there to be observed, or it just hasn't been observed. And so um, a couple of things to point out here. Um, box turtles, like I said, are long lived and they're, they're cryptic. So we need to maintain a high level of observation over a long period of time in order to generate the data necessary to estimate those population parameters. Um, and so again, I hope to be able to keep making talks like this and encourage more people to get involved over the long term so that we can generate the data we're looking for. There's another really important thing to point out here though. And it's critical that the individuals, that we are able to maintain the identity and the recognition of these individuals over time, right? And so we're putting this little tag on here. You might be wondering what happens if the tag comes off. 
Okay, that's, some, that's a concern, right, that we have because then the turtle would be wandering around and it would appear as if it's an untagged individual and we encounter it, we tag it again, and we think, oh, we got a new turtle here, but that's not the case, right? That would be a problem. So fortunately for us, there's a free program out, out there that was developed for, rec for uh, recognizing animal patterns, uh, individ patterns that individuals exhibit, and it's been used on a variety of animals. The program's called uh, Wild ID. And, and again, fortunately, it was tested on box turtles by a group here uh, who uh, at Bowling Green, Ohio State, published a, a, a paper on this. Turns out this program works remarkably well at tracking individual turtles over time just based on shell pattern. Uh, this will only work for adults because I mentioned earlier the patterns are only fully established at adulthood. Um, but you could do what we're doing without any turtle tagging at all. Um, simply by using this program. It's, it's that effective. And here I'll show you just a, just a handful of turtles that um, have been logged into the program. Here's on the left is 12 individuals, just a carapace photo. So I mentioned the photos you take directly overhead, we'll center them, we'll crop them. And you can see quite a bit of variation in the shell shape and also the pattern. Uh, and that's what Wild ID picks up on. And there's really a great diversity of these patterns out there. It's pretty, it's pretty awesome. Um, but I think this is even rivaled by the plastron pattern. So when we tag turtles, we also get photos of the underside, the plastron. And you, know, you have turtles that are completely all dark, you know, black colored to almost all cream, light colored, and then half and half and everything in between. Um, it's just amazing the, the color uh, and pattern variation that this species exhibits. Okay, a little bit about the results so far. So over the last three and a half years, and I'm only gonna talk about results from the Cove because that's the only place I've summarized the results for yet. And hopefully this uh, winter time I'll summarize, the up I'll update these results and so on and dig a little bit deeper. But we're almost, we're almost up to 350 individuals tagged in the Cove over the last three and a half years. And I think that's a pretty um, amazing accomplishment. 22 tags have been lost that have been identified using that program, Wild ID, and uh, 16 of those received the new tag. But not all these turtles still exist out there. 14 tagged turtles were found um, you know, uh, dead. 14 untagged turtles were found dead, and by and large, they are far away, far and away, the largest source of mortality is roadkill, uh, as you might expect. So anything that uh, can be done to try to reduce the likelihood of turtles being run over is going to be um, you know, beneficial to their populations. Um, and this is just a graph of the, the increase in number of turtles tagged over time. Here's a look at reporting trends by year. So we started in 2019 and then in early 2020 um, with a small grant from FSU, we were able to put a flyer in everyone's mailbox that lives in the cove. It was several hundred, maybe over a thousand of these flyers went out into the mailboxes of everyone in the neighborhood and just you know how to report a tag turtle and so on. Um, so we got, you can see that it really helped to increase the number of reports um, that were coming in. And um, we, so far we're maintaining a really high reporting level. I don't have this year's data up here, but as you can see, we're, we're getting on average um, 50 to 60 reports a month, so two per day. Um, and and all, almost all of those reports are being logged into the database by me. So it's, it's kind of like a little thing that I do at the end of the, the, the day is I'll sit down and for 15 minutes put the reports in that were sent to me. And here's a look at a pie chart of the number of different uh, citizen scientists that have responded or you know, reported turtles in the project. Um, we're now well over 1,200 reports in the cove, um, probably more like push in 1,500. Uh, what's with the blue wedge and the green wedge? The blue wedge are turtles that I found and reported. The green wedge is the turtles that my wife found and reported. <laughs> How do we find so many turtles? Like what? I'm a fish biologist, so this is kind of like not, not my wheelhouse, but um, once you figure out what their habits are and everything, if you're the type of person that likes to take early morning walks with a dog or by yourself or you run, the two of us are runners, you're gonna see a lot of turtles if you keep your eyes open. You gotta be out there between 6 and 7.30 a.m., especially during the heat of the summer. As soon as the sun is just a little above the horizon, those turtles disappear, and you will not find them until the, you know, the next morning they come out of hiding. 
Sometimes you see them in the later afternoon when the sun starts going down. But um, all these other wedges here are from different respondents. So 193 people as of end of last year have reported in turtle sightings. And that's, I think that's also um, a successful accomplishment. And obviously I want to thank anyone that's interested in participating here because um, without those reports, we won't have the data that we need. Okay, maybe I've got a minute to tell you a little turtle story. Um, I teased this in the flyer. Um, it is a fact that Bay County has the largest box turtle in North America. The largest, yeah. I, I say the world, but you know they don't exist all over the world. Um, but uh, this turtle was found last year by my wife um, in our neighborhood. And not only is it the largest box turtle ever recorded, but the one previous that previous largest one was 216 millimeters. And this, this guy measured out at 232. So we didn't just like break the record, we smashed it. All right, we smashed this record. And trust me, this thing was measured with a $600 pair of Japanese made <laughs> calipers. So I am certain that this record will stand, okay? Uh, he could not fit, this is the standard calipers we use. This is too small to uh, measure that, that turtle. Um, and he, you know, he weighed almost four pounds. So. All right, how can you help box turtles? Just a quick slide to summarize some of the things. Um, I mentioned watching out for the turtles in the roadway. This is especially true in the early morning low light conditions, you know. Um, don't assume it's a, a magnolia leaf, you know. Sometimes it, it turned on its side. I, I mistake a lot of leaves for turtles and then I find out oh, it's, not, it's not just a leaf. But um, if you do see one in the road, and this is probably the only time we recommend that you actually get involved with moving the turtle, what you want to do is, is move it to the side of the road in the direction it was headed. So if, if this is the road and it was here on the right-hand side and it was pointing this way, when you, when you spotted it, you move it to this side of the road, okay? Because if you move it off to the grassy strip on the side, it's going to just go back. That, turtles don't wander around aimlessly. They, they really have um, a lot of purpose in their movements and everything. So this guy's just going to, he wants to cross the road, but um, he saw you and he stopped. So you can help him across the road there and just, just set him on the other side. And again, never relocate a box turtle because of the homing instinct that I mentioned. Let box turtles be wild. You know, it's, um, you know, people, some people do feed them. Um, I'm not taking a position on that. You know, I'm not going to say that I never fed a box turtle either. But, um, you know, they, they will, they, some of them become actually, you know, almost like a kind of pets, you know, if you do, if you feed them on the regular. But I'm, I'm not encouraging that. I mean, we want these turtles to remain wild so that they can find their own food, you know, um, the, way, the way they should. Um, protect nests in your yard. I mean, if you're lucky enough to actually see a female box turtle laying a nest, and this takes hours actually to accomplish, so if you're in the right place at the right time, you might catch them doing this. Um, it happened to me twice last year with the same female turtle. It laid two different nests in two different parts of the yard. And what I did was I took um, this wire mesh thing here and fashioned something up that would go over the nest. And there's a little portal here that the hatchlings can crawl out of. Uh, and then I staked it down in the corners and put a, you know, a, a paver stone on there so that um, the predators couldn't get in there. So predators like um, a possum, raccoon, and stuff will, will go and they'll dig up the nest and eat eggs. And again, they're in, there, they're in the ground for a long period of time, two months, you know. So, uh, and this happened to be located where I was parked my golf cart, so I don't want to run it over. Um, so anyway, that's something you can do. You can get involved by telling others about this project and telling others about box turtle conservation participate in the project by citing box turtles, or reporting box turtles. And then there's some things that you can do um, in terms of how you manage your own property um, in the neighborhoods. We need a lot more trees in this neighborhood, folks. Um, and uh, I love what I'm seeing in terms of the recovery of, of, uh, of the community and great things have happened in the last few years, but it takes forever to grow trees. So the so sooner we can get started with that, the better, because um, that's not gonna happen overnight. And, and again, those, that tree canopy is, is very important to maintaining the type of conditions that favor box turtles. Um, you can also more immediately either provide or plant um, low-lying vegetation that provides that sh those sheltering areas that um, the turtles will use. And as far as I've been able to determine, I haven't found any one sheltering vegetation better than another, but thick stuff, you know, where you can't see the turtle, they like to get in there. If you have a fence around your yard, and I built, an, I had to rebuild the fence around mine after the hurricane, built this nice, really nice fence and everything, and 
Next thing you know, I was not seeing box turtles in my backyard anymore. And then, you know, it's, it re I realized that's because they couldn't get through the fence. So um, cut, you can cut little turtle portals in your fence. Um, if, and this, this works if you don't have a dog uh, that you're worried about getting out. But um, they use those portals. I've actually watched turtle, box turtles go through the little portals that I made in my fence, which is cool. You can also consider adding fruiting trees. And there's a couple in particular, well, one in particular that I would recommend, which is the pindo palm. I mean, not everyone's a fan of palm trees, I get this, but the pindo palm is the one that produces those orange, those clusters of orange uh, dates that are edible. Box turtles absolutely love the pindo palm dates. And when they're dropping on the ground, if you know, if you have a place in your neighborhood where you know someone has a pindo palm tree, between, I think it's like July, early July through August, those berries will be dropping, and in the early morning hours, you will find box turtles there. They know where those pindo palms are, and they will go to those trees early in the morning and grab the pindo palms. If you don't like the fruit falling in your driveway, you can pile it up you know, off to the side and leave it there, um, if you will, and the turtles will find it. Those are all my recommendations at the moment. Um, I hope to come back to this program at some time in the future, talk more about the results, you know, more about the science. This is just meant to be kind of an introduction to the project. So at that point, this is my last slide. I've got some, some references and some materials that I can um, point out to you. And then we've got plenty of time for questions. Um, if you want to learn more about box turtles, this is a great book. This is um, Ken Dodd. He was a, or is a professor at University of Florida. He wrote the North American Box Turtles and Natural History. Everything I know about box turtles is in this book. Um, uh, let's see. And yeah, that's, that's my recommendation and reference. So with that, thank you for your um, attention. And we got some time for questions. Can yes. Yes. Um, so first of all, you won't be able to tell until they're large and mature. So we're talking about a turtle that's a, you know, at least this big. Okay, if they're small, don't bother. You won't be able to determine sex. The males are going to be larger. Their carapace is wider and more flattened. Um, and then if you turn them over, the plastron has a concave depression in the middle. And the rear of the shell, these marginal scutes will be flared often. Not always, but often. The females are smaller, more domed, flat plastron, less flare. There's a couple other things that I won't get into, like the position of the vent, you know, um, but you know, the things are you're not going to inspect for. But those are the best ways to tell. But sometimes it's just not easy to tell. What about their eyes? Yeah, yeah, good question. So the eastern box turtle um, subspecies, the males have red eyes, but that is not true for the Gulf Coast box turtle. They usually have brown eyes. I have seen a little bit, a few with reddish eyes, but not, it's not very striking. Yes, sir. How do they navigate? How do they find their way? Back to Goodness. Um, that's, a, that's a million dollar question for a lot of animals, um, including the one that I study a lot uh, with my work, my work job, which is the Gulf sturgeon. Um, they, you know, if I had to guess, it may have something to do with um, just having good memory. <laughs> no, I don't know. I, honestly, I do not know. I'd have to look that up. Um, but, but I will tell you that they, they know how to get around, um, and they know which paths they want to take. After the hurricane, there was a lot of box turtle movement. I mean, the box turtles were everywhere. Um, and that's how we quickly got to 250 tagged in the code, because I think they were trying to reestablish their, um, the place they, you know, they were trying to learn their surroundings again and reestablish their home range. Um, this is just anecdotal, but this year I'm not seeing the movement that I used to. You know, it's just a little bit harder to find them in the road, crossing the road the way it used to be right after the storm. We've yes, ma'am. We've been talking about this question he brought up because he has a population at his house, and oh, I don't know how many, but he has one particular turtle who this makes me think that maybe. Turtles lay down some kind of an excretion that um, that um, other animals and things do. Okay. And and they are able to follow that back. Like a or 
I wouldn't be surprised if that were true. Do you know anything about that? Um, I can answer <laughs> that a little bit. Um, to the best of my knowledge, turtles don't do a whole lot of that. I know a lot of lizards do, but for turtles, that's not a big thing. Um, a big thing about turtles and how they navigate was, uh, especially with the sea turtles, like how do they find their way back to the same beach every year? And there's been a whole lot of studies over the years that have said it had something to do with the magnetic field and it had something to do with this and something to do with this. Uh, as of last time I looked into it, the studies about the magnetic field thing had been disproven. And they, the general understanding is that they do it by vibes. And then eventually they kind of get close and they start <coughs> seeing familiar landmarks. But they're definitely like, they definitely form habits. Like they will follow the same trails over and over just like any animal will. I happen to think they have good vision. I, I have no way to test that, but um, I'll be on a run in the morning and I'll see a turtle like way far off and he's walking and I'm the only one out there and all of a sudden he just stops, you know? I'm like, did you just see me from all the way over there, you know? And it just stop and it will st we'll stand there until I get, get up there and check him out, so. Yes. Um, I'm from New Mexico. I was saying that our turtles had red eyes or yellow, golden eyes, and we didn't want females. So here you say that our party, because my turtles in my house, their eyes are all the same color. You know, so far. The other yes. thing is, I had I have one that's returned for a long time, mm -hmm. and he's very distinctive. And I, ninety nine percent positive, he was hit because the shell was. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I didn't know exactly what to do. And you know, my first instinct was to pick him up and take him to a, a veterinarian. You know, this, and I watched the YouTube video where he was you know, putting paste on and the shell was supposed to go and all that together. Help us with Yes, that. yes. I'm so glad you asked that because um, it, it's, it's turned out to be an important thing to talk about a little bit because we do get calls um, from people like, I've got this injured turtle. Um, Officially, we're not really set up to handle or rehabilitate box turtles. It's just, it's beyond our capacity right now. But a couple of things I want to say about turtle injuries. Um, being long lived, they will sustain a wide variety of what appear to be um, pretty serious injuries that they can recover from. Um, I can show you pictures of turtles with cr major cracks in their shell. I can show you turtles with missing parts of the shell, puncture holes in the shell all the way through to the internal that then heal over, um, you know, left alone. Um, but we do have one person on the team who is a wildlife rehabilitator and, um, and she's turning all of her attention to box turtles now. So, you know, it's gonna be a case by case thing, but, but generally I think most of the injuries that people have contacted us about are not life threatening and they will recover from. They're a lot tougher than, um, than you might think. Well, you know, obviously, obviously not that I noticed it. Mm -hmm. Well, if you, if you keep seeing him come back time and again, he's, he's probably on, his, on the road to recovery, I would think. Uh, no? Oh, oh, since you had... Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I don't think there are many vets out there that are gonna, gonna help you out here. It's kind of a, a really uh, unusual case to bring a turtle to him. Yeah. Okay, okay. And if, you know, baby raccoons and baby squirrels and things like that fall out. Turtles, mm -hmm. you know, so I just long for you. <laughs> Maybe we can um, help you next time you, you see an injured one. And I don't, I don't know the exact website, but FWC does have a list of local, like, licensed <laughs> rehabilitators. Um, so if you look for wildlife rehabilitators in this area, you can find a, a database through FWC and what sorts of animals they specialize in. Yes, sir, all in the back. Yes, they are. Yes. Um, let me go back to this, um, the turtle mapper here for you. Um, turn this off. Okay, well, what you'll see is that, uh, well I didn't mention this, but we've got another um, kind of uh, group that does tagging in Gulf County. They call themselves Gulf County Box Turtle Project, obviously. Um, 
but uh, you'll note that there are locations here that are outside of the three neighborhoods that I mentioned. So if you cite box turtles elsewhere, we'll accept the data and we'll input it into the database. And then as the program evolves, and, and if a neighborhood has a sufficient number of really dedicated people to keep up with the, the monitoring effort, then we might stand up a tagging team. But um, I want to be a little bit judicious about just going out and tagging turtles anywhere because as I said, it's going to be a long-term commitment to really do the work necessary for science. And there's no real need to put tags on turtles unless you're going to commit to that long-term effort, in, in my opinion. Yes, ma'am. You mentioned winter dormancy. What, what triggers that? How long does it last? Um, I mean, I think it's just in response to the colder temperatures we have in winter. Turtle, box turtles here don't hibernate. Um, they, they find like some real thick, um, brushy cover like a wood pile or something like that and bury down into it and then just shelter there until the springtime um, warmth. But, but actually, you know, it's, it's not even like they just stay, stay there the entire time because on a warm day in January or February when you have those warm spells, I've caught box turtles out and about. But it's generally between, um, I would say, mid-December to um, mid-February. But any time outside of that window, they're, they're very active. Oh, probably um, below 60 degrees. Really? Uh, yeah. Um, but maybe below 55. You know, that's a good question for us to kind of uh, analyze our data um, with respect to, and I haven't, haven't done that yet. But um, typically the temperatures you'll find them out and about are between maybe 66, 67, and 78, 82, 84, you know, in low light, high humidity days after rains or or just early mornings? Yes, sir, in the back. The other uh, thing that the, they like is loquats. Oh, loquats, yeah. We got a loquat tree that drops every year, and every year there's a couple of, uh, one large one, one smaller one, come through the yard, and they put a hole in one side of the yard, under the fence, and a hole at the other side. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. I find them wandering around in my workshop, and I have to pick them up and put them back Yeah, in OK. So, Oh, but the oh your ponds oh, I haven't mentioned that. If you have a pond of water on your property, you're going to have the box turtles. Yes. Okay, do be careful about aquatic turtles, other species of turtles. Don't go just jumping on them, um, like handling them. I've had a couple of calls, like with some people send me a photo of this turtle, like hey. Is this one of your box turtles? And I'm like, that's a snapping turtle. I mean, I don't think you want to handle that one. Um, but uh, I will say that after handling several hundred box turtles, uh, I've never even had one attempt to bite me. Now, no guarantees, but um, and it's better left, to, better not to handle them at all. But um, that's one neat thing about this this creature is that they're they're very friendly and not aggressive. Yes. I yes. can yes. tell the difference between a box turtle and a snapping turtle. Okay. But yes. we were coming home from <clears throat> church on Huntington Road in Forest Park, and there was a turtle out in the middle of the road, and he stopped and said, quick, go put it up off the road. <laughs> I picked it up, and it scratched me and carried on, and I oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, um, now the yes. Thing, This question came up last time. So first thing about the handling the turtles, and be careful if you're going to stop to get one out of the road, because uh, I've had people tell me that like, we stop traffic on like Highway 98 to move a turtle out of the road. I'm like, oh my gosh, people like, be careful um, doing that. Um, to know if it's a box turtle, typically I'd say nine out of ten times you approach a box turtle, it's going to close up in the shell unless it's maybe been handled before. And if you have a turtle that is completely enclosed in the shell, you can't see its head, its legs, tail. That's a box turtle. If you encounter a turtle that can't do that and it's going to try to run away from you instead and not tuck up in the shell, it's probably not a box turtle. So that's, you know, that's a good rule of thumb. And then about the salmonella, um, here's the thing. I mean, probably all wildlife can transmit some bacteria or something to you um, if you're not careful. But um, 
so far so good as far as my involvement. I've handled many turtles. I just make sure that I'm washing my hands before I go and have lunch or something. You know what I mean? Um, so yeah, and, and they have claws, you know, and the, sometimes they're going to try to um, move if you pick them up. So you could kind of get maybe scratched, but if you're concerned about it, just don't pick them up. You can just get the photo and you're good. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes. Yes, I do. Um, in fact, last evening, Dan Catazon from the USGS made a talk about diamondback terrapins in, um, at the Episcopal Church in the Cove. Um, I heard it was a great talk. And he is the one leading up Gulf County Box Turtle Project. So yes, we've connected on that. Yes. Um, I think so. Um, I was told they're going to produce this um, and put it on somewhere. It's going to go somewhere. And then uh, once it's up there, wherever that is, I'll, I'll try to add a link to the Facebook page. Awesome. And maybe these guys can tell you more about it. Yes, um, Commodore Productions YouTube channel for Citizen Science. Within a few weeks, this, the crew will produce this talk, um, and it'll be you'll be able to view it again or share it with friends. And I'll put a link to, in a post on the Facebook page as well. Yes, sir. Is there any kind of turtle social life, or are they all yeah. individual? <laughs> I'm still learning about this, but it's, it's pretty amazing some of the things that I've witnessed so far. I would never have guessed. Um, mailbox turtles occasionally, or maybe more than occasionally, when they encounter one another, will undertake a sparring match. And so it's, it's pretty amazing. The two turtles will, will be going at it head to head, trying to bite each other, flip each other over. It often results in one being flipped over, um, and so on. And, and this, I think, is what results in a lot of the, um, I just call it erosion, but it's a wear away of the marginal scoots in the front. And it's, it's really, um, it looks pretty, um, pretty aggressive. They're not aggressive with people, but with each other. And I think it's a territorial thing um, that the male turtles do. Uh, as far as other social life goes, um, I think they're kind of loners for the most part, but when the females are receptive or whatever, I mean, males will be tracking them down, and I've seen males chasing female turtles before, um, and so on, and, and those sorts of things. It's kind of, once you start paying attention to what's going on in your yard in the early morning, you see some things you never thought you would. <laughs> how fast is the turtle chase? <laughs> oh, how, so that's another thing. If you spot a turtle in your yard and you think, oh, I gotta go in and grab my phone so I can get a picture of this and report it, it will probably have disappeared before you come back. They, they can move very quickly, that, and they, they really don't like to be seen, um, I think. I, I, I really don't think so. I, when they know that they're spotted, as soon as you're out of the picture, they're going to they're gonna bolt, and they can move pretty quickly. Have you ever seen two turtles mate? <laughs> I have seen two turtles mate, and it's, it's pretty hilarious. Um, I don't know, I want to stay G-rated here, but you know, the, um, the male turtle gets on top of the female turtle, you know, and, and then it, this could go on for hours too. Um, you know, the, eventually he's trying to convince the female to, to, to open up the, the rear part of the shell so, so they can do their, their thing. Um, but uh, it's kind of funny if you see two turtles on top of one another, because you'll do a double take and like, what is that creature, you know? It, it is very funny to see because what, what typically winds up happening if you startle them when they're in that compromising position is the female pulls into the shell and the male gets knocked off and he's just kind of hanging out back here. Right. And like they'll both poke their heads out and look very embarrassed. It's pretty good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 
This is the one time I would suggest not disturbing the turtles, just to, you know, for the sake of the future generation. But you know, maybe you can catch them when they're when they're departing. You get the picture. He entertains us with his story. Yeah, I see that. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> I don't know that there's been specific proof for box turtles, but I think with every, every turtle species that I'm aware of that's been studied, the temperature does play a major role in determining the, the sex of the offspring. I know it does with sea turtles um, as well. So they've started doing some projects where they put canopy cover over like turtle nests uh, just to keep the ambient temperature down. And then that way they can kind of like when the hatchlings come out, they can experimentally determine whether that uh, plays a role. So I, I do remember there was a study on sliders, uh, slider turtles back in Mississippi that was 25 years long. Um, and they had probes in the ground measuring ground temperature during nesting. Uh, and then every time a nest hatched, they looked at the turtles and it was showing the skew of the sex ratio towards um, I believe it was towards male. I sometimes get it backwards, but just as just very slight changes in ground temperature can make a big difference in like the sex ratio of your clutch. So that's another reason that it's important to have some of that shade, like the ground cover in your yard, because typically they're going to lay it in an open area that gets more sun. But the more different opportunities you give them, the better that population is going to be. Yes. Yeah, not yet, not yet. Um, we have a lot of really amazing ideas that we'd hope to pursue in the future um, as we free up more time and, and all. Um, making t-shirts or something to get hand out to the public in response to their participation is one of those things. Maybe getting involved with STEM programs here in Bay County is another. Um, for example, doing a more directed telemetry study to try to learn a little bit more about home range and stuff on turtles that might occur near one of the neighborhood schools is another idea. But um, yeah, all those good ideas hopefully will come to pass. Um, and we, we, we've also talked about potentially establishing ourselves as a nonprofit so that we could receive donations because right now we, we don't have a budget for this or anything, but that has not happened yet. Any other questions? We're getting close to seven. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. I enjoyed it. I'll hang around a little while longer if, if you want to check some stuff out here or what have you. All right. Thank you all, all again so much for coming. Um, our next, uh, next presentation will be November 8th. Uh, so look for information about that coming out soon. If you would, please make sure you sign the sign-in sheets uh, on your way out just so we can kind of keep track of everybody who is here. We really appreciate you being here.